Well, good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. It uh, looks like the attendees are starting to file into the uh, into the webinar here. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Andrew Reiner. I'm the Community Development Director with Art South Dakota. Um, and we're just so excited to have uh, Nikki Cox with us, a Senior Stakeholder Liaison with the Internal Revenue Service. Um, uh, for our session today titled Federal Taxes and Your New Business. Um, really looking forward to a lot of great information um, and, and really excited to, to have made this connection with Nikki. It's been incredibly helpful already in our conversations just via email um, and some ideas. Um, and wanted to give a, a special thanks to Tom Valentine from the South Dakota Department of Revenue for, for helping uh, connect us with you, Nikki, and uh, getting the conversation started to have you join us today. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to just quickly um, say a thank you to some of our partners who, who make this webinar series possible. Um, first and foremost, the South Dakota Arts Council, uh, as well as the Bush Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, for those of you in South Dakota here, we're getting incredibly excited for the February 15th Governor's Awards in the Arts. Uh, we'll be in Pierre all day at the Capitol uh, and then have the kind of gala honoring, uh, honoring ceremony that evening at Drifters in Pierre and really looking forward to getting the arts community together with the policymakers to, uh, uh, to continue the conversation about the impact of the arts and how important both for and nonprofit arts work is in the, in the state. Um, if you would like to ask any questions during the session, I will help facilitate the Q&A. If you would, please use the Q&A button in the webinar to ask questions. That allows us to, to more easily track them, and then I will share them with the, the speaker as we get to Q&A time. Um, but also, please feel free to use the chat just to say hello and to, to welcome your friends and colleagues here and, uh, uh, and have some general conversation. Um, I'll put this slide up again at the end, but just wanted to let you know that we have some other great sessions coming up. Uh, later um, uh, this week, we have a session with the South, staff of the South Dakota Arts Council uh, on their spring grants uh, openings. Then in early February, we've got a really exciting panel of panelists. So as many of you know, is if you're writing grants to organizations, you're actually uh, your grant is actually chosen by a panel, not by the staff of the agency. And so we have uh, some folks who have been involved in those panels that will give some tips and tricks on what was helpful for them so that you can write the best application moving forward. Uh, and then for the individual artists involved today, uh, we have a, a great session with Allison Morgan from Prince and Repeats Fine Arts Printing here in Sioux Falls uh, on kind of the basics of taking good photos of your artwork for uh, digital representation, for gallery, uh, um, uh, submissions for your online gallery, for uh, print, for for sales, etc. Uh, and some others coming up the road, um, including some sales tax sessions and more. So um, with that, um, I will uh, welcome Nikki and uh, turn over screen sharing to her and just really excited to have you with us and thank you all for attending today as well. Thank you, Andrew. So I'm going to share my screen here and All right, it looks like I've got what I went up. So thank you both Andrew and Jim Spears for inviting me here today. Um, a little bit about me. Um, been with IRS for about 27 years. And during that time, what I've learned about the entertainment industry is that most artists uh, value their time, their passion for their craft, and they get more happiness from their job than doing accounting or taxes. Uh, where many artists um, seem to struggle is on picking a form of business, selecting a good tax preparer, and setting up a system to make tax preparation and documentation for potential audits more organized. So I'm going to show you some things to help you with that, along with some of this year's new taxes. So first, I'm going to share a couple of secrets. The first is on irsvideos.gov. And it's for new entrepreneurs. So let's see, let me copy that for you. A lot of people just think we put everything on YouTube. It does filter to YouTube, but this is a little bit nicer because it won't let me open it up here. Oh, 
Okay. Um, has your screen changed, Andrew? Or do uh, I no, I'm to... still seeing the IRS uh, tab. So. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing, and then I'm going to go to share again. And I'm going to go here. So what I did is I typed in um, irsvideos.gov. And a lot of people don't know that we have our own YouTube channel, so to speak, or video channel here. And what I'm going to be covering today is under the businesses tab and under small business tax workshop. And then I'm going to be covering a lot of things that are just within lesson one. Um, but if I go back here, you can see that there's thing, there's other contacts here, other topics. If you have employees, if you're trying to figure out your tax deposits, it's a way to do it. If you're trying to figure out the deduction for business use of your home, um, a lot more here uh, that you can you can dive into. And this is obviously just the tip tip of the iceberg. So that's that's the first secret that I'm sharing. Second secret, um, I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm going to go back to maybe I'm not. OK, I'll just do this. IRS.gov. Hmm, can't reach this page. Oh, I'm missing a W. That would help. OK, and let me reshare here. So share screen this and hit share again. OK, so I should be back on the home page of irs.gov. Is, is that what you're seeing, Andrew? Okay, so this is this is the second secret that that I have, and this is where most of your tax preparers go to find answers to your questions, and then they charge you. So um, it's our website. We do have a website just for small business, and let me know if this moves. So it did change, good, okay. So um, this very first one that pops up here for you, small business and self-employed center. A lot of people don't go to the IRS website. Uh, they don't think to do that. But if you're a small business, we have, as you can see, a, a ton of links depending on where you're at and what you wanna look, what you wanna look up just, just for your business. And so the first part of my presentation is, is going to cover this page. Um, so I'm a list person because I think linear. Um, and uh, if I, if I want to just dive in and not have to think a lot, I want somebody to give me a list of how to start a business. So starting a business, I would naturally go here. And then I would go down to at the bottom. Right here is a list, checklist for starting a, a small business. So I'm, I'm gonna go into that. Um, and then here's kind of sort of your list. It's kind of sort of chronological, but it's kind of not. Um, applying for an employee employer identification number, pretty common. You probably know it more as a federal ID number. Uh, selecting a business structure. Are you gonna be a corporation? Are you gonna be a sole a proprietor. These are the two I'm just going to focus on right now for, for my first part of the presentation, but I'm just trying to show you where to go on our website so you don't have to take copious notes and you can just save these as favorites if you want or follow me along live on, on uh, the website. So EIN, um, Employee Identification Number. Um, Super easy to get. I'm surprised how many business owners don't know that they can get this from us for free right off of our IRS website. Um, but then I guess preparers wouldn't make any money off of you if they shared this. So um, apply for an EIN online right there. 
Um, and all you have to do is answer the questions and boom, you'll get an EIN that day. Um, I do suggest if you have access to a printer or a, a way to save the letter that instantly pops up after you apply for this, that you save it some way, either hard copy or electronic, because more than likely when you're getting this number, you're thinking about getting a loan to a bank or getting setting up a bank account, and they're going to want to see this letter as, as proof. All right, so the... Um, the other thing that's really important, so we're going to go back, get out of this EIN page that you need to think about is um, selecting a business uh, structure. And unless you've taken a business class, you may not be uh, familiar with this, uh, but some of your basic like law classes might, might cover this, like at a community college as well. But if you're not familiar, um, these kind of determine which tax forms you, you submit and fill out uh, and send to us as well. A sole proprietorship is just one individual who owns an unincorporated business by themselves. Then you have the partnership. It's a relationship, like it says, between uh, two or more people who join to carry on a trade or business. And then you have a corp corporation and they're almost treated like a separate person. Um, and they pass on their, this entity passes on its income, losses, deductions, and credits to their shareholders um, for federal tax purposes. So a lot more um, involved. Um, same thing with an S corporation. And then we have something called a limited liability company, or you've heard of the term LLC. And this is really a business structure um, allowed by state statute, but when you're filing your taxes with the IRS, you're gonna have to choose either corporation or sole proprietorship. But on the state side, they do have um, other, other options. Uh, and I do believe you can file as an LLC with the state. You would just have to check with the state of South Dakota. You want to be careful with this. There's not just tax considerations. There's also uh, legal uh, considerations. So most owners are going to bring in um, a not only an attorney, but a tax attorney that can look at both the tax side of it and the, uh, the legal side to determine which is best for you, not only from a tax stance, but also from a, a legal stance. So now I'm going to go over to record keeping. This. And so I've backed out to the starting a business page, um, a couple here. And voila, here's, here's the rec record keeping. Um, why do you want to do this? Um, to show whether your business is improving, if you care, which artwork or your productions or selling or, or what changes you need to make. You um, also want to um, make life easier for your tax preparer uh, for them to create something called income and income statements and balance sheets, which again, uh, banks and creditors are gonna wanna see when you apply for a loan. Um, you will want to hold on to receipts, um, business checkbook if you have one, uh, bank and credit card statements, contracts, mileage logs, or uh, whatever you have on a mileage app, and other documentation to show basically two things, um, proof of payment, and then what it was for. And that it also, of course, has to show when it when it happened. You can pick paper or you can pick electronic records. It used to be that we only took paper. That's not the case anymore. Um, I did mention apps. Um, these really make life easier uh, for you um, when you're trying to keep track of, of mileage <laughs> and it'll make life easier for your, your tax preparer too. Um, on this page here, uh, we talk about uh, 
you know, the burden and proof. And even though you hire a tax preparer, um, the burden and proof, the person that's always going to have to make up for the lack of taxes is going to be you. Um, so that's another reason why you want to uh, do, do record keeping. So what types of income or deductions might you be audited on specific to the entertainment industry? Um, it's not a big secret, but you do know where to look. And if you don't work for the IRS 24 seven, like I do, you may not know. So these can be found on something called the IRS audit technique guides. And so quickest way is I'm just gonna type in audit technique guides. And I'm gonna go to construction, retail. Okay, I'm gonna type in audit technique guides entertainment. Here we go, audit technique guides, okay. And then let's go, come here. Aerospace, architects, business, cash, entertainment audit technique guide. It's gonna take a little while to pull it, but while it's, this is pulling up, um, it is 115 pages. There's a lot of white space though on it, as you can see. And it talks about audits for performers, for producers, directors, technicians, and other workers in the film industry, the recording industry, and live performances. It touches on royalties and license fees, fringe benefits, advances, agents, equipment rental, digital music, downloads, um, and the music industry organizations, unions, showcasing, and a lot more. It does have a table of contents here. So I'll just uh, see if I can scroll down. So here you can see this, you know, it's, it's talking about equipment rental that'll give you an idea how to how to depreciate things or your preparer. It talks about meals, entertainment, and gifts, uh, educational expenses, um, court cases, if you have to go to court for something, uh, job searches, a lot more. So um, a lot of people want to read this just to think, you know, just to kind of know ahead, okay, what do I really need to keep records on? Um, your preparer, I'm sure if he's dealt with the entertainment industry, he's familiar, but you'll feel a lot more comfortable if you just kind of glance over this and, and see what an auditor would look for if you ever got audited as, as an artist. So I'm going to get out of this. So a lot of you are thinking, well, Nikki, who do I, who do I go to for a tax preparer? I get that question a lot. Um, unfortunately, I can't give you names, uh, even though I know names, probably most of them are maybe not the ones you wanna go to. Uh, <laughs> but okay, if you're looking for a, a, a tax preparer, you're just wanna, you're, you wanna go up here to the top and you wanna type in uh, choose, oh. Uh, ta a tax repairer. All right, and the first thing that pops up here is choosing a tax professional. Um, and so I'm gonna go over the links here a little bit with you. Um, until I worked for the IRS, I didn't, I thought everybody was a CPA. I didn't know. Um, even in college, that's the only term that they mentioned in my business classes. But there's 
enrolled agents, then their CPAs and their tax attorneys, and they all need separate credentials and they all need separate uh, qualifications. And so there's links here that talks about the, um, the differences between an enrolled agent, which basically can just represent you and do your taxes. Um, there is certified public accountants that can like represent you in court. Um, and then there is attorney tax attorneys and that's who you go to if you have to go to court. Um, and so it, it kind of gives you an idea what, what do you need as far as a tax preparer? Most people are just going to go to an enrolled agent or a certified public accountant, or they might even go to uh, other types of preparers that actually don't have these uh, certifications, but at the minimum, they're going to have to have something called a preparer tax identification number. And so you can go, we have a public directory here. You can see that there is a link and you can narrow it down by zip code, by uh, criteria. These are the different types of credentials that people have to have. And you can um, pull up a tax preparer. So Andrew, um, if you want, if you want to come off mute here for a second, tell me what's a, what's a good zip code I should type, type in for South Dakota. Um, let's do 57105. That's here in Sioux Falls where I'm based. Okay. And uh, do you want an attorney? Are you in trouble? Um, or do you want a certified public accountant because you want to go to appeals? Or do you want just maybe like a, a enrolled agent to do your taxes? I'd like to find an enrolled agent to do my taxes. Okay. And then we do a search here. And search results. Got quite a few there. Got 32 thing, people to choose from. And then uh, it gives you the distance. Search, uh, so if you want somebody that's right there next to you, um, there's, it looks like there's a lot of people right, right in that zip code. So it's as easy as that, um, trying, to find, trying to find a tax preparer. Of course, referrals are always good. Trying to, finding a good tax preparer is kind of like finding a good doctor or a good dentist. But at the minimum, you want to find out if they really have a CPA, if they say they're a CPA and, and if their credentials are in good standing. So this is where you would go to, go to find that information. There's, uh, go back to this other page here. Go back another. Okay, so there's a link here that talks about how you can avoid unethical ghost return preparers. Ghost return preparers are preparers that don't sign your return because they want to stay invisible to the IRS. Um, you want to stay away from them. If they're not willing to sign your tax return, um, then you don't want to use them. Um, we give tips for, for choosing a, a tax preparer here as well. And um, this talks about how, as I mentioned, you want to check their qualifications, make sure that they're really what they say they are. Um, if they've had any admonishments, you can check the preparer's history and see if there's any complaint about them. About them. Uh, service fees, um, I've, I haven't seen this in a while, but if they say that they want a percentage of your refund, or if they promise that they can give you a bigger refund without even looking at your information first, basically what they're telling you is they're gonna throw on some deductions that you're not entitled to um, and possibly um, get you in, tr in trouble with the IRS. So you don't want that either. Um, IRS, we still have a paper backlog from COVID, so you really want a preparer that e-files and um, does electronic deposits for you, as opposed to mailing anything to the IRS by paper. Um, we hope to be caught up. Last time I heard was by June of this year, but that's obviously going to be after our filing season. 
Um, you want somebody that is available all throughout the year. Um, and uh, there's a lot of part-time tax preparers out there, but if you get called for audit or you have a question on your return or you find something that you need to add to your return to have it amended, um, you don't want another preparer to have to start from the very beginning. Um, you always want to be able to review your tax return before you sign it. You wanna make sure that the preparer signs it and that prepare tax identification number or P10 number, you wanna make sure that they write that on your tax return as well. Um, regardless of whether they're an enrolled agent, a CPA, a tax attorney, or somebody without those credentials, at a minimum, they should have that P10 number. Um, so speaking of dishonesty, um, there are a lot of identity thieves who are going after not only individual information now, but also business information to file individual and business fraudulent returns to try to claim a refund or credit with your either your social security number or your federal ID number. I handle a lot of the data breaches and identity theft claims for our area, which is, is pretty big. Um, it goes all the way from Washington down to Oklahoma and over to, I think y'all are on the edge, South Dakota, North Dakota. Um, but anyway, we're, we're already starting to see some, usually there's, there's I've seen a, a a trend to this. This usually happens on a Friday or over the weekend because they know it's harder for you to contact us and, and to find out what to do. So what do you do if tax identity theft happens to you or your business? Um, yes, <laughs> you want to go to irs.gov. You want to do a search for identity theft. I'll show you how that rolls. And that's going to take you to this. And then that'll take you to this page here, Identity Theft Central. You're going to see uh, different links depending on, um, on who you are. Um, there's one for tax professionals in case their offices get broken into. But as if it's just your federal ID number, that got stolen, um, well, not just, but if it's your federal ID number that got, got stolen or used to maybe uh, be filed with a fake tax return or they're using it to file fake W-2s, click on business here. And it's gonna give you the steps here on, on what to do. Basically what you're gonna wanna do is, and where is it? There it is, not an affidavit. You can report it on the business helpline. That's what I would suggest. Um, if you, if all of, if, if you're a business with, let's say a whole bunch of social security numbers, like a production company with employees or a union, um, then you will want to bypass stakeholder liaison and you will want to um, email IRS directly to data loss at irs.gov. And it's here someplace. Um, but yeah, this, te this tells you what to do. It tells you to, to contact law enforcement and the other steps that you need to do to kind of get things shut down and sealed up so that the identity thieves can't do more, more harm. Again, they're probably going to hit you um, on the weekend. So if nothing else, I would go to irs.gov right now. I would say this is a favorite because chances are you're not going to be able to get in touch with us when this happens. So what if you're, uh, let's say, a sole proprietorship and just to use your social security number um, for identity theft? Um, let's get out of the business and you're going to want to report as an individual which is, well, we don't call them individuals, we call them taxpayers. Um, so this is gonna tell you um, what to look out for, um, 
and let's see how to report it. Um, basically, you're going to want to turn in a, a form with your uh, um, your tax return, and you're going to want to want to contact our identity theft uh, unit. I think it's under here. Let's do this. Oh, here we go. Okay, so you're going to want to fill out this form here. Uh, it's our I, form number 14039 for identity theft affidavit. You will be forced or your practitioner will be forced at that point to file your tax return by paper if the identity thief beats you to e-filing. That's just kind of how it works. It does take us a long time to unravel those cases. Right now I heard it's, it's like 360 days. And... Um, here is the phone number to contact our specialized unit. Um, I had to call them once on a weekend. And so this might be a phone number that you save as well. So knowing that if this is gonna ha happen on a weekend, you can, you can call them. Um, so this will walk you through everything that you need to do. Now, I wanna bring your attention to something that will keep identity thieves from filing a fraudulent tax return under your social security number. And it is called an identity protection pin. It's the easiest way to get, uh, to, to block them. Um, and we do have an online option. It's called get an IP pin. So you would go into this. And then, like most of our websites, we have a little button there. Um, if this doesn't work for you for some reason, if you don't, I, I believe you have to have a cell phone in your name in order to use this option. If you don't have a cell phone on, in your name under an account, um, you'll have to use one of the other alternatives. Or if you want to get, let's say, one of your children uh, an uh, and IP pin, they'll have to come into one of our offices. So this talks about the other ways um, of, of getting an IP pin. Basically, you would have to come into our office or one of the nearest offices, or you can um, ask for them to mail, uh, the, uh, mail something to you, and then IRS will call you and, and you can verify. It's kind of, kind of paper, kind of by phone. Um, I probably would skip that if I had to, but I encourage whatever you have to do to get an IP pin. I, at this point, really encourage everybody. Why doesn't IRS issue this to everybody? Because we've got people complaining, saying that they don't want it. Um, but this really tells us if we receive a tax return under your social security number and we don't see that IP pin, which changes every year, by the way, then uh, we know it's fraudulent or we know we're going to contact you and double check. And um, if, if you don't recognize it, then you would just tell us, hey, this is, this is not my tax return. And uh, that just confirms everything. And um, then we would tell you, you need to file your tax return by paper that year. Still, still um, go through the process of reversing off the fraudulent tax return but at least the money hasn't gone out under your social security number. And um, actually it wouldn't go through because they're, because you had an IP pin on it, I'm sorry. So if nothing else, a lot of people don't know about this. I don't know why people wouldn't want it. If somebody told me that I could get a free security system, I would jump on it. So my thinking is, why not take advantage of this layer of security for yourself and your family, which is free? Um, finally, with this Monday being the official kickoff of the tax filing season, I want to go over some tax updates with you so that you can get a sense of whether you might owe some more money to the IRS or whether you'll get a refund, and if so, how much. Uh, so I'm going to switch to my PowerPoint now. Let's see, how do I drag this down and get rid of the menu? Oh, 
Okay, go back to share again. Okay, share screen. Thank you, Andrew. No, it's still not. But, okay, there we go. I need to get rid of. Hmm. What if I do this? Can you see it okay? Okay, we'll do this. <laughs> um, so um, we, we did have a requirement that we were going to issue to people like Venmo and other third party settlement organizations like credit card organizations um, to issue 1099, what's called 1099Ks, um, if it was $600 or more. So that's been delayed. And this year is going to be what's called a transition year. You may or may not be getting 1099Ks from these people. Um, some people, some merchants already had it in the works and some uh, had we were just saying we're not we're not going to do this until they absolutely force us. Bottom line is, if you get a, a 1099k, you need to determine uh, whether you uh, should report that to the IRS as a um, if it's a personal item and and you sell it at a loss, you're going to have to put that 1099k on one part of it, and then uh, just do the amount that you bought it. Uh, you bought it for up to the amount that you sold it for making it a wash. Um, your preparer, if you have a preparer, bottom line is just bring that 1099K in to them and explain what the original purchase price was if it's something that you sold. Um, we, next year, it it will be uh, an, uh, an, uh, required. So, um, you might want to start keeping track if you sell on eBay, um, if you make crafts and you sell them on Etsy, uh, you definitely want to start keeping track of, of what you buy, it, buy things for and what you sell things for, uh, because you'll want to offset that income with, with your expenses and you need to, be, need to be keeping track of those expenses. Uh, let's see, what else? Slide three. So there's um, a lot of tax breaks that have changed since you filed your 2021 return. Uh, your financial circumstances might have changed, like if you sold uh, some of your assets or you were laid out off. And if it turns out that you owe more um, this year, the deadline is April 18th. So you got a few extra days instead of the typical April uh, 15th. So as you can see from uh, the impact updates on this slide, uh, there were aspects of the American Rescue Plan Act that will impact this filing season. Um, so I'm gonna cover some additional information on the earned income tax credit and the premium tax credit for uh, filing season 2023. So the um, American Rescue Act, it made several significant enhancements to the earned income tax credit for last year only, but the three items on this slide, they still remain for 2002 and they are permanent changes. So you, you can now, if you're um, single, you can still, uh, you can, you can invest up to $10,000 um, instead of $3,650. Um, and you can see that if, if you are something other than single, then the inflation amounts go up for that as well. If you have a, a, a client, uh, I'm sorry, if you have a child um, who is a, 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 just goes to the preparer by themselves, uh, but they don't have a social security number. Um, in the past, they could not get the earned income tax credit, but now they can. Um, so that's not going to stop them. Um, if you have 
spouses that are married but separate and they don't file a joint tax return, now they may uh, be qualified to claim the earned income tax credit if they meet certain other requirements. So um, if that's your situation, make sure you, you check with your tax preparer so that he can see if you now qualify for the earned income tax credit. So um, premium tax credit, um, if you don't buy your own health insurance, uh, you're probably familiar with this. Um, the potential credit was increased because of the required percentage of annual income to a head of household that had to contribute uh, that decreased and it as low as 0% for the lowest earning of head of household and a maximum contribution of 8.5% as annual income of household increase. The eligibility has increased because even households above 400% of the poverty level can now qualify if they spend more than 8.5% of their income on health insurance premiums purchased through the state exchanges. And uh, this applied for both 2021 and 2022. And um, these premium tax enhancements now have been extended through 2025. So remember the premium tax credit is only available for those who purchase coverage through a state exchange or marketplace, not your uh, insurance maybe that you would normally just buy through, um, by through your employer. So mileage, um, last year was a little strange. Um, if you're calculating your, lading your mileage and you're giving it to your uh, tax preparer, he's gonna want to know what would your, was your mileage up until June 30th because the mileage rate at that point was the 58.5 cents a mile. And then he's gonna wanna know what was it July 1st to December 31st? Because the mileage then was 62.5 cents per mile. So just uh, be aware of that uh, when you're, when you're giving, giving your preparer mileage. And this just talks about the increases for charitable organizations. If you're driving for charitable organizations, you can't take as high of a deduction. It's 14 cents a mile. Uh, for medical or moving per, uh, purposes, it's 22 cents a mile. Most people just care though about that first one I went over. Um, the, we have um, some provisions that expired and these might be of interest to you if you're itemizing your deductions. Um, individuals who received unemployment compensation in 2022, they will not be able to exclude that amount for purposes of calculating the household income for the premium tax credit like they could in the past. For 2023, the businesses will need to remember that the maximum allowable amount for, for meals and expenses will now be limited to 50% of the total spent regardless of the source of the meal. So that's a little bit of a change. Uh, for those of you that do Bitcoin or uh, other types of digital assets, brokers, they're not required to report additional information with respect to uh, people that dispose of this, this digital assets um, until probably the start of, of next year. So stay tuned for that. In the meantime, uh, you might want to start keeping track of, you know, of if you make a pro profit on selling any of the your Bitcoin or or any other digital digital assets. And here's my contact information. So, Andrew, any questions? There. Um. Please, anyone feel free to, to jump in to the Q&A or the chat and let us know if you have any questions. Um, a couple that, that came up for, for me as you were going through um, is just uh, looking through the list of, of folks on the, uh, the attendee list. I know a couple are on the visual art side of things. So when you were looking at the, um, the entertainment audit guide, 
would that that same document apply uh, towards visual artists, whether it's, you know, painting, sculptural work, or is there a different category for that? That's the same one. Yeah. Perfect. Yep. Yes. Um, can, great. I know that's all we, we always struggle with that, too. When we say arts, everyone thinks visual art. and We're like, no, it's everything. And then when people say entertainment, sometimes they think, oh, it's only performance. And it's, so it's always nice to have that clarity. Well, let me let me double check here. I, I think it does. I'm going to stop the share because it did talk about copyrights and I would assume Perfect. that I would cover everything. Yeah. So let me go back to. Let's see. This. And then do I. Can you see my screen or do I need to share? Um, I think you'll share it one more time. Okay, I don't see the share option. Well, if you can, oh, here it is, share screen, I'm sorry. Share screen, I'm sorry, I'm learning. Uh, let's see, there's that, share. So let's go to those audit technique guides again, and let's see if there's something different just for art, uh, for sculptures and other people. So I'm just gonna type in audit technique guides here. And where is the homepage to them? There is something there about retail. I don't think that you would fall under that though. Okay, oh, for exempt organizations, we're not there. Okay, let me try this again. Can tell you as an auditor i didn't even know that this maybe it wasn't i don't well that's because we didn't have the internet when i started um let's see about iris publications audit technique guide Okay, this is for exempt organizations, but maybe they have something. They, I, I, I don't want to hold you guys up, but this is where I would go just to double check, and this yeah. is how how I would find out for sure if they have something different for artists. Perfect. I do yeah. see one for art galleries, which which is is different. Um, okay. but, um, but yeah, so I, I look just quickly looking through the, the link from earlier, um, on my screen, it, I don't see anything in particular, so I'm guessing it would be the entertainment, but, um, um, but yeah, that's really, um, really helpful. Um, okay. um, a couple other questions that have come up. Um, one is, is just, uh, someone that has done a little work in the digital assets. They've, They've purchased a couple of, of uh, NFTs for digital currency, and they're an artist that are creating some of those. Um, are there any guides currently for what the tax implications will be for those, or is that still in that's flux? Probably, that's, yeah, that's probably still in flux at this point. Um, IRS, we're still trying. I think the only people that have anything in writing at this point are our criminal investigation people for, for um, for that but it's that's all going to have to be ironed out by the start of next year so i would say stay tuned for that yeah and if great. i hear anything then if you want i could do like a, a separate presentation on that yeah. when they give me the, the okay to do that but yeah yeah well it's nice to just see how how you know i'm Every time I've been to the IRS site, it's usually been to find something specific. I need to do, I need to download a W-9 to fill out for someone. I'm looking for a very specific form. So, you know, this has been incredibly helpful just to see 
not not only the the quantity of information but those portals you know you're starting a small business having that that portal there that gives you a little bit of the step-by-step -step bullets is incredibly helpful instead of just you know going to google and getting maybe outdated information or old links or you know so it's really nice to to see how much of that is there um there's one more question that I don't believe you can help with, but I want to double check. Um, there was one question uh, the person asked, do you have any advice regarding online sales tax um, from multiple states after the Wayfarer Act? Uh, you know, they're finding that being overwhelming. Um, I know the IRS doesn't really deal with any of the state sales tax, but just in your experience, have you had, have you heard of any resources uh, that people have used? Um, um, or is that um, not something in your uh, uh, experience? Well, I used to do, I, I used to be in California and I would do presentations um, in conjunction with the state divisions that oversaw sales tax. Um, they, I'm not quite sure who that would be in South Dakota that handles sales tax, but I would go to their website and um, they might have um, a, a stakeholder liaison where you can raise your concerns to them and then they could elevate it up where they might have what's called a taxpayer advocate mm -hmm. that could also um, hear the reasons why why it's a burden and lots of times if they hear enough people talk about something then uh, they'll change it or they'll they'll pull back and they'll say we're not going to do this because it is such a burden mm -hmm. Um, so that's, I, I would go to the sales tax agency. I assume that she's in South Dakota. Yeah. And okay. in South Dakota, it's the department of revenue. So they might be able to provide some, whoever that it was an anonymous question, but um, okay. whoever asked the question, there may be some opportunity there for you. And then as far as, as uh, other states, I do know that for artists, that's a, a dilemma. If you're, if you have an online shop and you're selling across multiple states, now that you're, you're collecting sales tax from multiple states that can get to be a lot. But what I would recommend to the, to the, um, uh, whoever posed that question is to, to do some research research with the whatever um uh, if you're doing an online sales, if you're using any sort of a platform, many of them now will uh, track that for you, um, maybe for an additional fee, but you may consider a different type of online um, um, sales service than what you're using now that can help you with, with some of that tracking of, of all of the states now that we, we have to track all that. But, um, but also just so you know, that is something completely separate from the IRS. Um, you know, it's, it's the, the dilemma we, we constantly run into with nonprofits as well when they're new of, Oh, well, I'm nonprofit. I don't, I don't, it's like, no, you don't have to, you know, you, you don't have to pay federal tax, but all of your state sales tax, all of those, you know, that's still a totally different thing. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's, it's always the dilemma there. I have heard of, I used to be a restaurant manager, so I am familiar with sales tax, but I have heard that there are some people out there that are selling uh, NFTs where they will purposely take off the software, purposely takes off the cash sales, therefore decreasing the sales tax as well. So you wanna be careful of who you buy from. Uh, the, uh, the IRS is onto that now and I'm sure the states are onto that as well. So just be cautious when, yeah. Uh, yeah, when you're shopping for that. Yeah, thank you. And that that was the other thing I really wanted to highlight is is the uh, the link that uh, all of these links will will be emailed out as well as as uh, provided in the chat earlier. But um, just that that choosing a tax professional that was incredibly helpful and seeing that there's a resource of of being able to verify that if someone says they're a CPA, do does the IRS agree? Um, that that <laughs> they might have been ten years ago. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, and, and, and like you said, sometimes if you, if you personally don't know their name, that's probably, that might be a good thing. Cause it means you haven't had to deal with them as being reported for being someone shady or someone doing untoward things. So, um, it's really great to have these resources available. Um, so we're, we're coming up on the hour here. So, uh, thank you so much, Nikki. It, it, it's been great to get a chance to meet you. It's been really wonderful to, to get some updates on, uh, on this current year's, uh, um, uh, tax, uh, 
as well as just learning a lot more about what is available. Um, I know I'm going to be taking a deep dive through the, the entertainment audit guide. Uh, I also uh, have, uh, am a musician and, and have self-employment um, um, income that I deal with there. So I know I'm going to be taking a deep dive to make sure that my tax preparer has been catching everything and I haven't been missing things uh, as well. Um, but we will be emailing out um, the, the recording of today to the attendees as well as the links from the chat. Um, and please uh, feel free to reach out to me at any time at Andrew at Art South Dakota if any of you have any questions or we can be of any service. And uh, watch for more webinars coming soon. And we really appreciate all of you joining today and everything you do uh, to help keep South Dakota creative. Uh, thank you so much, Nikki. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody.